Hello, everybody. Um, this is Dr. Ford again. Today, we're going to talk about Keynesian theory. Uh, last session, we talked about classical theory. Uh, up front, um, I am, to a very large degree, a Keynesian economist. I do believe in the basic premises. I am aware of the weaknesses of the theories. There are all theories have weaknesses. But to a large degree, I think we have found that uh, most of the ideas that Keynes talked about still have validity today. And we seem to act as if they have validity today in terms of our national response to recessions and inflation. Uh, most certainly, Keynes, no, Serge John Maynard Keynes, he's a, it was knighted actually, um, basically uh, did most of his writing in the 20s and the 30s. He was a major figure in uh, the British, on the British scene, the economic scene, but also well known to the general public. Uh, he turned uh, classical economics pretty much on his end uh, and on a very logical basis. As logical as classical economics seems when you're just within that model, when you actually take a look at the way in which he challenges some of the aspects of it, you recognize there are significant weaknesses within the theory. In Keynes, the consumer is at the center. It's not the producer. The old, you know, if he was to hear the idea, well, you uh, can't tax the uh, job producers, he would say you can't tax the consumers. And most certainly, it's not suppliers and big corporations that he was concerned about. Uh, he, in essence, by focusing on the consumer on demand, you could almost argue that Keynes said that demand creates its own supply. And I think that is a valid statement. I think that is a valid a shorthand term. If demand is not there, nobody's gonna produce anything. It just isn't gonna happen. You can have idle resources. And therefore, very contrary to the classical theory, since supply, is, he does not assume that supply creates its own demand, you can have long-term recessions, and you can have involuntary long-term unemployment. Keynes recognized, and this is very important, that consumers and businesses consider somewhat many of the same factors. If there's something going wrong in the economy, if there's something logically or some whatever, and you see there is a something that raise questions in your mind, either because it's already occurred or because it could occur, you become conservative. And I say this in the most positive sense about conservatism. You're careful. You know, Ben Franklin, conservative. Penny earned is a, a penny saved, a penny earned. And consumers start saving money for a rainy day. And businessmen say, hey, is this a good time for investment? Am I going to be able to make a profit on my investment? And as a result, what happens is that when consumers start being concerned about things and start spending less, well, the people that they spend the money on, I mean, the goods and services, they get less money and they start spending less. It's called a multiplier effect. And businesses start recognizing there's no demand. And therefore, they start questioning as to whether or not it's a good time to expand the restaurant. And what you find out is that savings does not equal investment. Going back to the formula for GDP that we talked about in the last lecture and also on the section GDP, GDP is equal consumption plus investment plus government plus exports minus imports. Well, in the classical model, when consumption went down, savings occurred. That savings became available, supply creeps on demand, investment went up, and it was just a change from contemporary consumption to a preference for long-term future investment and future consumption. Under Keynes, when consumption goes down, investment also goes down, and you're going into a recession, and there is not necessarily an easy out at that point particularly if it's a severe recession. There are other critical differences. He totally questioned 
their interpretation of the quantity theory of money. Yes, it's true, but it's definitional. If you take the average price, P times Q, the total quantity of different goods and services produced in the economy, it has to equal the money supply times the velocity, the time, the amount of times that the money turns over in a given period of time. Whereas the classicals assumed that Q was kind of fixed and the velocity was kind of fixed. John Maynard Keynes recognized that the velocity of money does actually decline during recessions. And if it declines during recessions, that means that Q or the total quantity of stuff being produced will also decline. And that you might be able to compensate for this because money has special properties and he didn't believe in the veil of money, you can actually increase the money supply potentially and stimulate demand and pull it back up to full employment. These are very different. Prices will recline in a recession. But this is another point. Classical automatically assumed that if there is a surplus, prices will decline. But in reality, prices don't decline very quickly. If you've been working for $25 an hour and you've established a, a record that you're worth $25 an hour, you lose your job and somebody offers you for, for uh, a job for $12.50 or even $15 an hour, you're hesitant to take it. One, there's gonna be a loss. I mean, you may not cover your mortgage and your insurance and all your other expenses. And two, all of a sudden, now it starts establishing you as a $15 an hour type of employee. All right, you know, look at car dealers. You know, they're supposed to be rational business people. I've gone to car dealers lots of times and they have a car and I'll say, oh yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, hey, I'll offer you 15,000 for it. Oh, I can't sell it to you for 15,000. I've got too much in it. Oh, what they're saying is, yeah, they may have put more than 15,000 in and they have a hard time dropping the price, even though that particular car may not have been selling very well. We just have a hard time dropping our prices. And since they drop slowly, the recession occurs because we can't catch up. That mechanism they're talking about just doesn't work. Another thing that was a, a particular point that uh, Keynes wanted to make was that even savings that do occur aren't necessarily available for investment. And what this is called is liquidity trap. What is the liquidity trap? Liquidity trap means that the money that is saved potentially could be for available for investment isn't. Obviously, people logically think, and this is understand, you have to set the classical perspective, that uh, if you don't spend, let's say, $1,000 in a month because you're worried about the economy, then basically that money is available for business. But businesses don't want savings accounts or something that's due in 30 days. They, they want long-term bonds. They want something they can rely upon for five, 10, 15 years. Well, if you take your money and you put it in a thousand dollar bond, and let's say it's not paying much, it's only paying 1% interest, it's interest rates are low because there's lots of savings right now. You logically think it's a classical stud that something's better than nothing. But let's say, you do buy that $1,000 bond. And six months from now, you decide to sell it. And actually this applies whether you want to sell it or not in terms of real value. But you decide to sell it. But the interest rate has now gone to 2%. Now, when the interest rate was 1% on your $1,000 bond, you got $10 per month interest. Now, six months later, they're selling bonds for 2%. And that means that you get $20 per year for your bond. So when you go to sell it, is anybody gonna buy your bond for $1,000 that pays only 1%? 
No, they're going to go get the ones that pay 2%. Unless, of course, you reduce the price down to maybe $910, which means that in six months, instead of just getting $10 of interest or $5 of interest, what you've done in essence is lose $90. Therefore, you just do the equivalent of taking your money under the mattress rather than investing it. Put it in savings accounts where you can get it within 30 days as necessary. Recognize what happens here is that this causes a multiplier effect. What you spend in your expenditures are somebody else's salary, somebody else's profits. And Keynes recognized this. And so when you stop spending and that money doesn't go somewhere else for some other kinds of making money, such as a business investment, it means that other people also have reduction income. And of course, they in turn will then therefore spend less at the grocery store and other places. And those places also receive less money. And therefore, your one unwillingness to pay $1,000 of your money out for consumption means that it will multiply in effect. And therefore, a $100 billion shock to the economy in terms of loss of income may translate into two, $300 billion worth of loss to the economy and a significant movement toward a recession. Now, understand there are ways that you can conceivably get out of this, but these do involve one of the things that classical economists did not want to consider, and that is the third term in GDP. That's the G part. We can collectively, as a government, decide we change things to try to compensate for these changes of individual behavior. Keynes had what he called a savings paradox. What was rational for the individual consumer and family was not necessarily rational for the economy as a whole. So anytime somebody says, well, if my family has to balance their budget, so should the federal government, now that's nonsense. We can collectively decide with government that we want to pick up some of that slack, creating jobs, creating additional growth. Understand that when you go through a recession, you're not only having temporary loss of income, you're also means that at the end of the recession, you're at a lower point than you would have been otherwise. And if you can do something to be at a higher point, you will increase earnings not over for the next year, but maybe for the next 10 years. Keynes made sense. Are there flaws? All oh, there are flaws, but we don't need to deal with those today. Thank you very much. I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.